to right center field. Did he get enough? Yes! How about Bo Bichette bringing us into at the letters with his big swing on Wednesday night? Dan Schulman with the great call, great atmosphere at the ballpark. Really good uh, to be there, sitting next to you, Ben, witnessing uh, playoff-like moments at the Rogers Center for the first time in a long time. That's awesome. Uh, this is, of course, at the letters, presented by Miller Light, the original light beer. He's Ben Nicholson Smith. I'm Arden Zwelling. Today is Thursday, September 30th. Uh, we are getting this one out before tonight's consequential game uh, at the Rogers Center, game three of what is essentially a playoff series with the uh, the New York Yankees here this week. Uh, also going to be a big night at Rogers Center because it is National Truth and Reconciliation Day. So really looking forward to seeing the pregame ceremony and everything that the, the Blue Jays have planned and, and just kind of taking that all in. That's going to be uh really really cool to see and man just looking forward to another night then of, of playoff baseball it's like it's not the playoffs but it really kind of is the playoffs for the blue jays it's been awesome to see it has been it really has been it's been so great to watch baseball games that have just so much significance i mean every single night every inning every decision it, it all has so much significance so it's yeah it's been you know, it really has been like playoff baseball. And as you know, we look ahead to the last four games of the regular season, it's crazy that it's down to this point right now. But the last four games, um, it, it's going to be incredibly compelling uh, to, to watch how it all unfolds. And one way or another, like it, we know it's going to be memorable. And I was thinking that after the Yankees came back to tie on Wednesday night and it's a 5-5 game, like either you're getting a heartbreaking loss or you're getting an incredible finish. And as we just heard, we got the incredible finish <laughs> where Boba Shett ends up hitting his second home run of the game. But, you know, that kind of applies to the Blue Jays' season as a whole. Either they're going to come up with some incredible way to pass the Mariners, who are still ahead of them in the standings, the Reds <laughs> and the Red Sox, or it's going to be a very painful ending. There's a part of me that sort of is cheering for the Mariners just because it keeps chaos alive, right? Just like it keeps the uh, the possibility of absolute craziness on the final weekend of the season and perhaps even beyond into tiebreakers on Monday and Tuesday. It just keeps that alive. So it's kind of cool that they're hanging around. Like Oakland's done now. They're out of it. But there's really only like a game or two in it between the Yankees, Red Sox, Blue Jays, and Mariners. And here on Thursday, the Mariners are off, um, and the Blue Jays, Red Sox, and Yankees are all going to play. It's possible that things will be even tighter heading into the weekend when the Blue Jays get three against the Orioles, the Yankees have Tampa, and Boston is going to have Washington. Uh, the scoreboard watching is like every night you know i'm going home and catching the west coast games last night dodgers and padres played a crazy game um you know in that wild race like you might have the dodgers winning like 500 games this year and playing in a wild card game yeah. uh it's just the best time of year for baseball it, it is 100 percent. and like like you said with the mariners it's hard to believe but here they are and i think that at, you know at this point in the season teams earn their way to where they are and the Mariners, like we can point to their run differential. They still won those games. They still found a way to win those games. And so I think they deserve credit for being in this race. And, you know, I, I get that there's a temptation maybe to point to the run differential and, you know, I highlight that difference, which is, which is pretty uh, considerable between the Blue Jays and the Mariners. But look, the Mariners won those games. They're in that yeah. spot. So, you know, as much as projecting these two teams forward, which team has the most major league talent? Of course it's the Blue Jays. They're way better. They're way better positioned for 2022, but it's not 2022. It's still this current season. And, you know, that adds even further intrigue because for the longest time, we've just been looking at the Red Sox and the Yankees as the competition that the Jays are facing. And the run differential is almost irrelevant at this point because really it's like the Blue Jays have four games left and the Mariners have three, right? So say the Blue Jays win uh, here on Thursday night and these two teams go into the final weekend of the series tied both at 89 and 70. Yeah. It doesn't matter what your run differential is over the first 159 games. <laughs> it's over. Those games have been played. That's all baked in. It doesn't matter. It's What's going to matter is how you play over your next three. 
and what happens going forward. Like it's almost like what's in the past is in the past. It really does. Like it's funny how a baseball season over six months of like grinding through like who's going to start tonight and our bullpen's worn down and this guy's hurt, that guy's playing left field and he's actually an infielder, but we have to use them out there. And we're going so far down our 40 man roster and we're plucking guys off waivers, like all this stuff that teams have to do just to get through this slog and just to get to the same exact place and be this close in the standings and have it come down to the final three games of the season. It's great. Yeah, it really is. And, you know, ultimately the run differential that matters is the one Thursday night, you know, everything else is out the window. Right. So, you know, it's, it's so, it's so cool to see the stakes uh, be that high and to see every decision play out with such significant ramifications for not only your team, but for the rest of the league potentially. Um, So, you know, with that in mind, the Blue Jays have to be very careful as they navigate this. They have to put a lot of thought into every decision. They have to make sure they're gathering all kinds of information because, you know, just to take one example here, Lourdes Gurriel Jr., okay, is he good enough to play? He says he is. Is he really? What do his swings look like? If he can't play, who's the DH? If he can play, what does that mean for who has to play the outfield? And what does this mean for the overall composition of the bench late in games? Is Lourdes better as a pinch hitter option as opposed to, you know, like all of these little, little things end up having having ramifications further into the game. And that's just one example for one team. Yes, and that is foreshadowing to the second half of this podcast. And Ben and I are going to kind of dive into what we think, uh, you know, the Blue, how we think the Blue Jays should line things up here on Thursday going into Game 3 against the Yankees. We're going to have a piece up at sportsnet.ca as well, looking at uh, some of the decisions the Blue Jays are making going into this game. So you can check that out. Um, but let's just, like, look back very quickly before we look ahead um, and just look at the first two games of this series. Because, like, it's a playoff series. So it's kind of like you can think of it as, like, Game 1, Game 2, Game 3. You sure. kind of sit in it and examine some of the things that have happened going back to Tuesday, quote unquote, game one, um, Hunjin Ryu versus uh, Jamison Tyone. I mean, here's the thing with that game. Like the Yankees were the better team, clearly. Um, The Blue Jays had two runs on three hits. Like the offense just was not getting it going on that night. Um, But I think that like as the Blue Jays, you can beat the better team if you are getting like the luck and the flukes and the BABIP on your side. The Blue Jays weren't getting that. The Yankees were the better team, and they also were getting the fluky stuff with the, the Anthony Rizzo like bending at the hips to you know flick a uh, Hunjin Ryu cutter headed for the dirt into left field, where you know Corey Dickerson collects it and throws it into Gio Urshela's back. Giancarlo Stanton hitting a bomb off of Trevor Richards' best pitch, which was like. 15 inches off the ground literally like go get a tape yeah. measure and from the ground up 15 inches that's where that pitch was yeah. Jalen Carlos then hit it like 420 and he's feet. Six five. so on him that's like his ankles that's crazy right like it's insane uh what he was able to do like that type of crazy fluky lucky stuff was all going the Yankees way so the Jays just kind of like tip your cap in that game you're just like not our night you know we did not show up with the bats tonight and the yankees kind of were getting all of the, the breaks it's tough to beat a team when when everything's going you know when, when they outplay you and also everything goes their way 100 percent, and yeah the yankees earned it they you know to have stand and judge going at their best i mean this this is a, a fun team probably not for yankees fans but from afar it's kind of a fun team because they have these huge huge players who just are so powerful Joey Gallo standing in left field can basically wave at us in the press box, like at eye level. You know, yeah. they, they just have these He's huge Luke Voigt, massive, massive yeah. players with so much power. And it's a fun model for a team in a sense. Um, and, and yeah, when those guys are on, it's really tough. You can see why they are as good as they are. Um, you know, and at the same time, for me, the biggest, the biggest takeaway for me from that game was seeing Ryu come back because we were yeah. wondering, you know, after 10 days away, He's a Cy Young finalist each of the last two seasons, and yet he has really struggled in the last few months. And so it was hard to know what he was going to be able to give the Blue Jays. And I think what he gave them was something pretty good. Like it wasn't ace level. It wasn't what the Blue Jays were hoping for when they signed him, um, that he would be at, you know, in the second year of this contract. But A, he was on the mound and, and healthy enough to go. 
and B, the stuff was improved. Like he was up to about 93. There was some more sharpness to the breaking balls and he was able to locate his changeup at times better. So, you know, you're looking at an overall combination of, of pitches that plays reasonably well. And that's all the Jays need from Ryu right now. They have their ace. It's Robbie Ray. They have their number two and three, Barrios and Manoa. So Ryu is a four on this team and you need your number four. And what he gave them that game was, to me, definitely enough for what you'd expect from a number four. The bar has really come down for the you know twenty million dollar ace. Who, like at yeah. this time last year, right? We were talking about the remarkable season that he'd had, and he was heading oh, yeah. towards getting Cy Young votes, and like he carried the Blue Jays pitching staff through that shortened twenty twenty season. And now we're talking about, hey, can you just be fine? <laughs> yeah, and he was right. He wasn't peak Hunjin Ryu, but I don't think anyone was expecting that going into it, right? Based off of like the recent results that we had seen from him, he was actually much better. Than he has been like you said like in fastball was like sitting 91 92 saw a few 93s from him in that game um you know the velo on the secondary stuff was all like in line even above season averages like i thought that um like he was actually locating his change up pretty nicely um for the most part and i thought his his cutter was playing really well sort of into righties away from lefties as he does um you basically made like one really bad mistake and that was the pitch to judge right it was that was a cookie man like just like center cut fastball um but then like you know Rizzo gets him on a on a good pitch I mean you know the hardest hit of the night was like a Giancarlo Stanton ground out like it was a pretty good outing from Hunjin Ryu really and if Rizzo doesn't like you know serve that ball into left field like if Rizzo swings and misses at that as like you would expect a pitch like, like, don't let anybody fool you into thinking that's, like, a good approach from Anthony Rizzo. Like, you shouldn't be swinging at that pitch. And you should, <laughs> like, you, that pitch was, like, a foot outside the zone. And he had, like, to sacrifice all of the power from his from his lower half in order to get his bat to it. I mean, I, that is, that, to me, that is that is luck, the fact that he serves that into left field. I know some people will tell you, that's Rizzo's approach. That's what he does. Like, I don't think that's a good approach in today's game. So, like, I, look. Ryu is fine and you know I will hear the argument that like we should be expecting him to be 20 million dollar a year ace level Hunjin Ryu uh it's more of like a conversation for like year three of this contract really yeah. and of what where to set expectations then yeah. like right now you will take what you can get out of Hunjin Ryu and I think he gave the Blue Jays a chance in that game hundred percent. I think for, you know, for the 2022 over-unders, we can have one about Ryu yeah. and really have that discussion about, hey, what what to expect here, right? But, you know, in the meantime, it's what can you get from him? And it's, is he better than the next guy up who would be Ross Stripling? And the answer is yes. So, yeah, I mean, you look ahead to Sunday now. And let me throw this at you, Arden. So sure. you've got regular rest for Sunday, which let's assume... Let's let's imagine the scenario that this game means a lot. The series finale against Baltimore. Because the other scenario is just not as fun to discuss. So if Ryu um, were to stay on his regular turn, he is that starter for Sunday. Do you have any hesitation about giving him the ball for that game? I don't. Um, but I might also like consider bringing back like a Jose Barrios on short rest or asking Robbie Ray to essentially throw his side session in the yeah. game, right? If Robbie Ray's going to yeah. go out and throw a 30 pitch side in the bullpen anyway, and we've all heard his sides at Rogers center where you hear the grunts ringing around the place at three o'clock in the afternoon, I might just ask him to do that yeah. in the game. It will depend on how things line up, but yeah, I, I could see that possibility. The thing is then you are, and look, you don't know if there's going to be a tomorrow, but if there is a tomorrow, then you've got Hunjin Ryu in game 163 or possibly, yep. you know, in a wild card game. So it, that's, it's an interesting decision. I hope we got to a point where the Blue Jays are making yeah. it. That would be really cool. It, it would be because, you know, I think these decisions get progressively more interesting for a while. Then they actually get less interesting. Like if the Blue Jays were to make it to the ALDS, then for then at a certain point, OK, yeah. you know, they're, you just kind of punch and play um, for a few games at least. But when you're in this week, essentially, of one must-win game after another um, in yeah. succession, yeah, the decisions are super, super interesting. And I, I tend to agree with you. Like, in theory, if for some fluke, you know, the Red Sox are losing and the Jays are actually going into that game with a really good position, sure, no hesitation about, about throwing Ryu. But I would also have in the back of my mind Barrios, who actually looked really good against the Yankees on Wednesday. 
yeah, it would be on short rest for Burrios yeah. is the is the thing. So it'd be you know you'd have to have a real good plan behind him. You'd have to know exactly how far you can push him. But the other thing is like with Hunjin Ryu, like are you going that much further beyond two trips through anyway? Right? Like no. you even saw it in in the start the other night, right? Like as soon as he started his third trip, like it was you know both ends going, like it the you know, the rope got really really as short. It as it should, right? So if you're only going to trust Ryu for two trips anyway, yeah, maybe you bring back a Brios, um, who's only going to give you a short start, but you're only getting a short start out of Ryu anyway, likely. Um, Brios, who, by the way, is so dialed in right now. Like, when he's throwing like he was on, on Wednesday night, I mean, when he was, what, perfect into the fifth, uh, like good luck man <laughs> like when he's using the i was kind of like remarking to you in the press box about the movement on some of his like fastballs which is like you know he's always trying to get to his curveball like that's probably his you know best big league weapon but like man his fastball was nasty um on wednesday and he's just locating everything perfectly like he didn't have you know huge swing and miss numbers or anything like that like you know it wasn't like a you know like a jacob de grom like 20 whiff night or something it was just like i am locating everything off the heart of the plate like garrett cole was more on the plate than brios was like brios is everything to the edges called strikes you know like um you know give a little credit to Therese mcguire who like did a, a nice job behind the plate of receiving and um you know clearly like brios prefers to throw Therese mcguire at this point like that's why he was in there because i think brios likes the way that you know reese mcguire receives his pitches um even if you kind of look at the lineup and you're like geez like reese mcguire's bat in a game of yeah, this i don't import. like it. i think it's pitcher yeah. preference man and i think at that point the DJs will take it and Barrios was getting called strikes on the edges and his stuff was effective and look at how well he pitched. So it's kind of like that push pull of like, you're going to have, you know, two to three, maybe, you know, not great Reese McGuire play appearances in this game versus Jose Barrios pitching really, really well and being perfect. Um, I think it was into the, the fifth, like as long as he was, I mean, that's the decision. Yeah. And I mean, the results were great. Um, and Barrios is really good. Totally agree yeah. with you there. I mean, he has really finished strong for this team after that um, trade deadline acquisition. He's had a really good second half to the season. And context is everything there, too, because, you know, this isn't against the Royals on May 15th. This is the Yankees. It's almost October and he's still dealing. So give Barrios credit. Now, you know, with the catching thing, you know, and they match mats up with Maguire often. And then you have you know, Kirk often with Ray and you have Jansen with Ryu. Yeah. I don't know. Like if you, if you go by pitcher preference, then are you really going to start Reese McGuire two out of five or, you know, three out of 10? I don't like that. I just think, you know, especially at a time that Danny Jansen, who's a good defensive catcher is swinging the bat really well, tapping into his power OPS over 1100 since he came back from the injured list around August 1st, I'd rather see Danny Jansen there. And I don't really see, a strong argument like I know I understand the, the argument that the Jays have made that you you just relayed there but yeah. that doesn't sway me ultimately I think the Blue Jays are looking at it and saying like our top five is legit right Springer yeah. Simeon Guerrero Bichette Hernandez those guys can score a bunch of runs Corey Dickerson's bats coming around in a big yeah. way right now like I think it's uh, five of the last six balls in play are like 98 miles an hour or harder like he is like showing up at exactly the right time <laughs> Um, we'll talk about Guriel later, but like, you know, look, your top five, top six feel pretty good about. And I think they're saying, look, we can sacrifice a bit of offense at the bottom of the lineup. Kirk, by the way, pretty cold lately, like yeah. in a pretty significant slump. Yep. So really, if you're looking for offense from the catching position, you're probably like Danny Jansen's kind of the guy who would be yep. bringing it for you. And then like we, we like Danny Jansen, totally capable of leaving the yard, but like we've seen the season that he's had, right. It's not like you put him in and he's, you know, real Muto or something, right? Like, so I, I, I kind of understand it from the Blue Jays' point of view. If Barrios is going to be that good and he's that comfortable throwing to Reese McGuire, like I think it becomes a conversation in a DS, like in a divisional yeah. series or in a CS. Like that's when you start going like, all right, <laughs> like what, what are we doing here? But yeah. I think for now, if that's what's going to let you get the best out of Barrios, you can just trust that that like top of your, your lineup is going to produce for you as it did on Wednesday and get the best possible Barrios that you can. If it was me, I, I don't think Reese McGuire would play again this year. And, mm -hmm. as, you know, he's been an important part of their season. He's a good defensive catcher. 
I just think they've got two better options right now, which is remarkable and certainly hasn't been the case all year. I'm not trying to like knock down Reese McGuire. Like he's yeah. an important part of the team, but I just think it was hard for me to imagine the day that I wouldn't prefer either Kirk or Jansen in there. Uh, Brios, by the way, uh, like I don't think that like Blue Jays fans have really realized just how good he is and like what kind of season he's having. He is like top 20 MLB starting pitcher this yeah. year like he's gonna he's getting close to 200 innings he's not gonna well i don't know maybe there's a 163 or 164 maybe he'll get there doesn't look like he's gonna get to 200 but he is like right there wow three five era yeah you don't realize it right doesn't wow. it fly under the radar a little bit it does and you know what guess how i was looking at this the other day guess how many pitchers in baseball have 200 innings it is a small number five or six maybe it is like, four I it say is four and so barrios to be that close is telling yeah, like uh, I don't think Robbie Ray's there. Um, it would be nope. yeah, a few and all guys probably. Um, yep. That's neither here nor there. But yeah, like Jose Brio's going to get Cy Young votes in the American League. That's like how good he's been. Um, down ballot, obviously, but like that's how good he's yep. been. Like it's, you know, let's give this guy a little bit of do here. He's yeah. been having a fantastic season. The other thing that stands out to me from these first two games, you look at the first game, right? It's kind of funny. The Blue Jays, they lose a tough one, and all of a sudden, we're all picking nits, right? And all of a sudden, the Blue Jays are too aggressive and uh, they're making too many outs on the first pitch of plate appearances, right? They aren't working counts. Like, you know, these hitters are all too similar. They're too easy to pitch to. Um, but then Wednesday, they win a close one, and now all of a sudden, everyone loves the aggressiveness, George Springer doubles on literally the first pitch of the game, um, you know, before Marcus Simeon goes deep. Bo, Bo Bichette, uh, you know, what he doubled on a first pitch later in that first inning, hit both of his homers on the second pitch of the AB. That's like, that's the approach. It's not changing. This is game 158, 159 of the season. This ain't changing. This is it. The Blue Jays are an aggressive team, and they're going to live and die by that. Like, this is the way they have been built. This is the way that these hitters are productive. This is how Bo Bichette has the, like, phenomenal season that he's having. This is how Vladimir Guerrero Jr. ends up in, like, you know, MVP contention because he's like, yes, he can um, work a account, and yes, he does have very good vision of the plate, but he's also liable to, like, swing out of his shoes at the first pitch of the game. I don't, if you're a Blue Jays fan, you don't want more like Anthony Rizzo ABs where he's like getting fooled by cutters off the plate and trying to flick them into left field. You want guys who are barreling the ball. You want guys who are like attacking pitchers and ambushing guys. Like this is, you know, it's an approach that can lead to some three hit nights like we saw um, on Tuesday. It can also lead to Wednesday. It can also lead to nights where you score like, eight nine ten runs it could also lead to nights where 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 it works like it's almost like uh you know like the it's just it's it's game 158 159 of the season you're not all of a sudden going to be like all right let's change what we've been doing this whole time and start working some counts this is what they are this is what the blue jays should continue to do it's what they're good at it's what they it's what's worked for them go out be yourself do what makes you great a hundred percent agree. And I'm glad you brought that up because I had a couple people ask me after that loss on Tuesday and particularly that Rizzo hit, Hey, is there a case to be made for the Jays to, to change their approach? And my answer at the time was no. And I, you know, I just think like, this is the team it's worth remembering. This is the team that has more home runs than any team in major league baseball. They have a second baseman who has hit more home runs than any second baseman has ever hit in major league baseball. They've got a 22-year-old MVP candidate in Vlad Jr. who's approaching 50 home runs. Like, they are an exceptionally good home run hitting team. It's not like they're up there trying to hit home runs and failing. They are up there trying to hit home runs and succeeding. So that's the literal best possible outcome for a hitter. <laughs> Let them do it. Yeah. And, and, and I should also add to that, you know, if they advance to the playoffs, they're going to have some games where they look bad offensively. And people will bring this discussion up again. And just remember, they are here to hit home runs and let them hit home runs, even if it means you sometimes swing and miss. This is the approach. It's not time to change it now. Um, and so, yeah, I don't expect them to change it either. As Bo Bichette says, uh, yeah, I was out there trying to hit a home run. I had a plan to hit a home run, and I hit a home run. 
Uh, and thankfully he did because we get another uh, incredible game to, uh, you know, to analyze and, and watch here on Thursday at Rogers Center. Let's step away, but let's get into that game when we come back and some of the decisions the Blue Jays are facing when we continue on At The Letters. It continues on At The Letters, Arden Zwelling, Ben Nicholson-Smith, and it is time now for Keeping It Light. Presented by Miller Lite. And uh, Ben, this time next week, we'll be thinking about wildcard games, uh, the craziness that we get in in those two uh, annual clashes. Uh, I'm going to give you a field of the entire MLB starting pitcher database. (laughs) You could have any guy who's currently an MLB starting pitcher. Who would you have starting a wildcard game for you? Now, are these pitchers healthy? Yes. Okay. I mean, if they're all healthy, I mean, first of all, it's a great decision to be able to make and probably uh, the envy of the general managers who will be scraping together whoever's rested um, for those wildcard games next week. But if they're all healthy, for me, it would be pretty easy. It would be Jacob deGrom. I just think he's the best pitcher. I think the numbers bear that out. I think that he's just dominant in a way that other pitchers aren't. And I mean, You've got your Max Scherzer, your Garrett Cole, your Robbie Ray here in Toronto, and so many good pitchers, whether it's Zach Wheeler, you've got Walker Bueller having a great year, but those guys are having great seasons. Jacob deGrom is having a peak that's on par with the great peaks for starting pitchers in Major League history, you know, up there with your Pedro Martinez. And to me, if that guy's available and healthy, it would be a very quick decision, and I would be thrilled to hand the ball to Jacob deGrom. It's very hard to disagree with that because Jacob DeGrom is the best pitcher on the planet. But I want to be different. Um, so I'm going to go off the board and I'm going to say Max Scherzer is going to be my guy. And like even, you know, look, his last two starts actually haven't been that great for uh, for the Dodgers. But then like a couple of starts prior to that, he uh, that one against the Cardinals when he was just like untouchable. Um, it's it's wild, man. He's 37, uh, but he's still like throwing as, as hard as ever in mid-90s. Like stuff's still just as effective. And I guess the X factor that Scherzer would bring you in a one-game wild card playoff uh, is the fact that he is uh, a maniac and insane. Yep. And just like that edge mentally is why I'm going to go to Max Scherzer. Like we've all seen the postseason track record with him, right? Like it's it's exceptional. We've all seen him in big games. Um, like he won't let you t- like take him off the mound as his manager. He is stalking around. He is staring at guys. The intimidation factor. I want the uh, the borderline psychopath on on the mound for me. That's my guy. Yeah, it's a good call. I mean, yeah, you would be thrilled to have Max Scherzer out there as well. He's, I mean, what an amazing career, late, uh, you know, sustained, sustained peak for him as well. One more thing with DeGrom is if it's a National League game, which, you know, in in his case, it probably would be, then you also get the benefit of him hitting, and he happens (laughs) to be a great hitter as well. So, I mean, there are a lot of reasons to like Jacob DeGrom. I didn't think about that. Uh, The Blue Jays don't have either of those guys, but they do have Robbie Ray going uh, here on Thursday in the biggest game of their season after the biggest game of their season yesterday and before the biggest game of their season tomorrow. But this lines up really nicely. Like, if there's one guy you want to have on the mound, a game you have to win against the Yankees, and I really do think that if the Blue Jays lose on Thursday against the Yankees, like... For all intents and purposes, it's, it's, it's not literally over, but it's as close to over as it gets. Um, the Blue Jays need this win big time, um, and they got their best pitcher on the mound. They got a Cy Young candidate on the mound. And I guess the question then, and this is going to you know relate back to a piece that you and I have up at sportsnet.ca here today on Thursday, is how much leash are you giving Robbie Ray? How much rope are you giving him? Like Considering the season he's had, but also considering that you know some things about third trip through the order and about you know how things tip- typically go in, in games like this. How are you walking that line? Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's a difficult decision um, in some ways. And I, first of all, would agree that, you know, must win game in baseball, probably overused as an expression, but I don't think it's a stretch to say that Thursday's game is basically a must win game. Like, yeah, you know, if the Red Sox lose as well to the Orioles maybe things shift but the Red Sox probably beat the Orioles so yeah you're looking at a game that basically is a must-win game and with respect to Ray man he's your ace he's the best pitcher in the American League this year he's going to win the Cy Young in all likelihood depending on what the results are but based on the information we have right now he would likely beat Garrett Cole for the Cy Young and 
that's not a guy you're going to be in a rush to take out of the ball game. You're going to want him to give you seven or eight innings in the best case scenario. And I don't think that's too much to ask. Like, it's a lot to ask. But given what he's shown the Blue Jays this year, emerging as, as you put it, a starting pitcher who, who pitches like a reliever, and he's better than the Blue Jays relievers. He's better than any relievers, basically. Yep. I just, I think you want like seven or eight, uh, you know, and, and, and of course you watch the swings, you watch his stuff, you watch his velocity, you watch his body language, you talk to him, you try to get a read. If, is he fading in the fifth? Okay. You make a change. Like you, you have to be open to that, but best case, I think you're looking at around seven innings. Robbie Ray ain't taking himself out of that game, Ben. That's no. the thing. So you got to be very careful with some of that subjective feedback that you're going after there. Um, like I'm keeping a real close eye on the objective feedback. So like the live yep. pitch data, right? So the velo, the spin rates, the movement. And I'm like certain yeah. that every team in the league has somebody in the back who is watching all that stuff live. And it can relay something to the dugout of like, hey, this pitch is losing effectiveness. Like, hey, he's wearing down. Like we are seeing some concerning trends here in terms of the the data we're getting on his stuff from track man right like it's okay with robbie ray will even like sometimes they'll kind of go up and down during his starts and you kind of know that right going in but if you see like a real serious decline that's when you gotta start thinking about it because look for as good as robbie ray has been this year like you said probably gonna win the cy young has not been immune to the third trip through penalty man yeah. you look at his ops's against um throughout the season First trip through 587, second trip through 569, third trip through 863. He is, yep. when he has gotten hurt, it has been on the third trip through. I would have zero hesitation letting him begin his third trip through the Yankees yep. lineup, particularly if like the, the stuff all checks out and he's getting efficient out. It's like, yeah, absolutely. Of course, nobody has earned more rope this season than Robbie Ray. So I got no problem with him. Even going a full third trip through the lineup, if like everything is cool, he's getting out, so the stuff is still effective, er all those boxes are being checked. But what I am saying is that like as soon as DJ LeMayhew comes back up for that third plate appearance, like I'm not letting Pete Walker get too far away from the bullpen phone. Yep. You know, I, like I am thinking, like I have my contingencies in place. I know what I'm doing. I'm not hesitating to get someone up behind him if I have to. Like the potential like downside of Robbie Ray seeing that guy getting up in the bullpen over his shoulder and maybe that Doesn't impacting matter. his confidence. I don't, yeah, forget that. Like I'm, I'm not, I'm not messing around. I'm going to have somebody ready because like when things go bad in an MLB game, a third trip through, they can go bad really fast, particularly yeah. against this Yankees lineup as we have seen um, with some of these hitters being as hot as they are right now so that's kind of the way i'm approaching it yeah. but yeah i'm 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 hoping that robbie ray like gives me at least six and i got no problem yeah. with him giving me seven if he's showing that he's capable of it absolutely you know i think that's a good way to to go into that game you know you have um as he's as he's starting that third time through you have somebody who's starting to move around and do some core activation exercises in the bullpen and you know just get their heart rate going a little bit you know maybe they put down their coffee they they know that hey if he gets into trouble here um you know you're going in and yeah egos like does it doesn't matter yeah. it doesn't matter robbie ray has lots of confidence he is not even going to be noticing who's up in the blue jays bullpen he's locked in you're not worried about that so you know it does lead to some interesting questions with the bullpen though as far as you know if he does give you six seven innings you still got two or three left you know how do you how would you approach that part of the game if you're the chase so you're you're gaining as much information before the game as you can because look adam simber's pitched four of the last five he's pitched yeah. back to back so i am like checking in with him after he's done his rmk routine in the afternoon i'm telling him like if you're sitting down for a meal like you're eating with your left hand like you know let's be careful <laughs> here uh but like I, i'm checking in with him i would expect that he's available because it was in so on Tuesday in Tuesday's game he threw three pitches Wednesday's game he threw 16 obviously you're throwing more pitches in the bullpen and more goes into it when you get warmed up and everything like that how stressful were each of those pitches Rizzo gave him like a hell of a battle on Wednesday how stressful was that plate appearance but I'm expecting that I'm going to have Simber available probably not for multiple innings but I'll have him available to face you know three 
four batters. That's good. The only other workload concern I really have is Tim Meza threw 20 pitches on Wednesday, um, you know, gave up the, uh, the hit to Higashioka, didn't look his best. He's a little shaky. So just checking in with him, how he's feeling before the game. My leash on him is probably a little bit shorter than it normally would be, but I'm still not hesitating to throw him back into leverage. So those are my two guys, assuming they're available, healthy to pitch. Yeah. Those are my two guys where like Robbie Ray comes out of the start in his you know fifth or sixth inning, runner on first or second, one out, two outs. I'm bringing in Simber to face the righties and get me that ground ball that I need. I'm bringing in Mesa if it's like a Rizzo or a Gallo coming up. And then I also have a well-rested Trevor Richards in that spot yep. if I need him, if I like the matchup. But I might honestly even just kind of save him for a clean inning and let Mesa and Simber be the guys who sort of bail me out of, of a tough spot uh, if Robbie Ray leaves in the middle of an inning. Yeah, I think all that makes sense. Like, you know, with Simber, I agree he's available and needs to be. And, you know, you're not shying away from using him three in a row. Like, this is just that time of year yeah. where your veteran relievers, they're going to just have to pitch a lot. And, of course, they'll embrace that. And that's just what you have to do. So, that being said, you're not going to him for an extended outing. It's more so get you out of a uh, situation um, that that's, you know, a, a bit of trouble. So, I think that makes sense. Richards definitely has the chance to factor. Um, so those three are available as setup relievers. And then you get to Jordan Romano. And to me, you know, he he pitched obviously on Wednesday, very effective through 12 pitches. So he's available. And I wouldn't hesitate to use him for an extended outing if needed. So get to the eighth inning. Let's say best case scenario or best case is they're up by seven. But good case scenario, the Jays are up by one or two runs. Let's say it's the Stanton judge portion of the order. So very good right-handed hitters for the Yankees. In that situation, maybe you have Mesa available. But to me, I would go to Romano there if I was the Blue Jays. And if that means Romano has to pitch two innings, so be it. He's done it twice this season. So it's not something that he's never had to do in his career. And he's been effective. He's had the chance over the course of the last week to not have to pitch too, too much. So... You could ask this of him reasonably. Of course, it would put him out of commission for Friday, but I think that would be a reasonable ask. And if it's Stanton and Judge in the eighth, I go to Romano. Yeah, I got no problem asking Jordan Romano to give me, you know, four outs, five outs. If it had to be six, okay. <laughs> I'd rather it was four or yep. five. But uh, he was just cold on uh, on Wednesday, man. Like, he was just surgical. Like, he just, like, looked, yep. like, locked and dialed in. Like, he was peak Jordan Romano. Um, so yeah, like undoubtedly that is my guy for that like late game leverage spot. If it starts earlier, great. Um, in the ninth, I don't care who's winning this game. I think Jordan Romano pitches that inning regardless. Doesn't matter who's ahead. Um, I could even envision a leverage spot in this game for Nate Pearson. And yep. I'll tell you the circumstances in which I could see that. Let's say Tim yep. Meza is shaky again, right? Like let's say I bring him in for like for for Rizzo or for um for Gallo, Gallo, right? And he's just you know he's missing the zone again. Doesn't look the best. Like we've seen it with with Mesa before. Like sometimes his sort of shakiness kind of comes in bursts. I'm gonna have Pearson behind him, man. And I'm not you know once Mesa's faced his three, I might be going to Pearson there because I just need to get Mesa out of there. I need to give myself the best chance of winning this game. I could also see a spot. Where, like, say I've got runners on second and third and one out, and I've got a righty coming up. I don't, I'm not sure I want Simber in that spot because the ball's in play and he doesn't miss bats. Like, it's going to depend what the yep. score is, but if it's really tight, man, if I'm protecting a one or two run lead, I got runners on second and third and one out, I'm bringing in Adam Simber. Yeah, he's probably going to get weak contact, but it's going to be contact. And the ball's in place. So now I am risking, like, you know, getting babipped in that situation. I might rather go to Pearson, who hasn't been as consistent as Simber in leverage, but who misses bats and gives me a greater chance at a strikeout. And in that spot as well, I've got first base open. So if Pearson gets on the mound and he has a little trouble finding the zone, I at least have that little bit of cushion. There's risk there. Absolutely. Um, you know, Pearson is not as proven in those spots this season as Simber is, but I think in that spot, I really need a strikeout. I really need swing and miss, and I might be going to Pearson over Simber. 
that's a really interesting one. Um, and you can make a good case for going to uh, to Pearson there. Um, I, you know, I, I think I would be open to using Pearson in this game in leverage as well. Um, you know, you look back at his game log, and he's mostly come in for clean innings. So it would be a different ask. And again, this is the time of year that you have to be comfortable pushing guys to new territory, asking different things of them. Um, but I would just be mindful of the fact that he's only come in with a base runner on once this season. So, you know, to put him on a second and third, ultimately he can either perform or he can't. Lately, he's been really good too. So I don't think it's off the table. But for me, I think I would look to Pearson more as like an extra innings guy, right. um, potentially. And, you know, depending on that, you know, that's obviously unlikely, but extra inning games do happen. And if the Blue Jays have burned Romano for 30 pitches in the eighth and ninth, you get to the 10th. To me, that's Nate Pearson. Oh, I could totally see an extra inning game. Are you kidding me? For yeah. sure. I could see this thing going extras. I could see Julian Merriweather coming into the game, right? I could see the Blue Jays having burned through their preferred leverage options and having to go to, look, Julian Merriweather was warming up on Wednesday. You know, like that kind of shows yeah. you that Charlie Montoya will go to him in a in a tight spot if, if he feels like he has to. Um, how are you lining up your, your batting order? For this one like i think like you know your top five are pretty obvious right like springer yeah. simeon guerrero bichette hernandez what do you do from there with kind of the bottom four which is where you can have some different uh interpretations yeah exactly i mean so starting with the catcher so we know robbie ray's pitching that pretty much means alejandro kirk is catching so i would put him in there then you've got the lourdes guriel jr decision and if he's been healthy enough to dh the last couple of days you know Led to believe he's certainly not fully recovered from having Randall Grichuk step on his hand, as you would expect. That will take some time. He got stitches. But Guriel has been so good in September that for me, he would be in there. And beyond that, you're looking at another outfield spot. With Guriel DHing, that means you're choosing between Dickerson and Randall Grichuk. And with a fly ball pitcher on the mound in Ray, I'm tempted to get Grichuk in there so you can have him play right field alongside Springer and Teoscar. And in addition to that, Corey Kluber struggled against right-handed hitters this year. So that would give Grichuk the nudge for me ahead of Dickerson, who of course can then come off the bench. And lastly, you've got Espinal playing third base. And, you know, Espinal has actually been hitting pretty well. He really doesn't seem to have, have um, you know, lost a lot of feel at the plate um, since coming back. And so I'd comfortable... I'd be very comfortable slotting Espinal in probably as the eight hitter ahead of Gritchuk. So I agree with you. Kirk is behind the dish. That's what Robbie Ray prefers. That's what I'm going with. Kirk's been a little cold lately, but I hope I get a big swing out of him. Um, I actually have Corey Dickerson hitting ahead of him. So I've got the typical top sure. five and I've got Dickerson at six. I like getting a little lefty bat up there a bit higher. So you're not going like six straight right-handed hitters. Um, and Dickerson also like kind of getting hot lately. Like the ball coming off of his bat, like pretty high rate of speed. Six of the last seven balls in play, been 98 miles per hour or harder. Um, this means nothing, but he's five for 14 against Kluber. So, I, I, like I said, that's a super small sample, but I really wouldn't read too much into it, but it does help the argument. Um, and also, Kluber, a guy who like throws a bunch of pitches, mixes and matches, but does throw a lot of curveballs. Four of his last five outings curveball has been the most used pitch and Corey dickerson has a 365 woba against curveballs this season interesting nine extra base hits off of curveballs who has been ben toronto's worst performer against curveballs this season lourdes guriel jr and that is not the only reason he's not in my lineup but that is one of the reasons um the second reason is i don't think he's healthy enough to contribute I just, I have watched him the last two days and I have seen two strikeouts and six ground balls and the average exit velocity on those ground balls is like 86 miles per hour. There's been a bunch of them that have been in the seventies. The ball's not coming off of his bat at a good rate of speed. He's not getting the ball in the air. He doesn't look like himself at the plate. I just think his hand is too injured and I like credit to him for trying to gut it out and trying to get through this. I just don't think that he's healthy enough to contribute right now to be the guy that we saw earlier this month. Like you said, it's not, it's not that long ago that like Randall Grichik stomped on his hand with spikes. Like it's nothing against him. I just don't think he can grip a bat, you know, effectively enough to, to, to do what he needs to do to be good 
at the plate, so he's kind of out in my lineup. Um, so I go Dickerson, Kirk, and then 8-9. I've got Espinal in at 8 as well, playing third base, like the defense. Um, and just I just think he's earned it. And I agree with everything you said about Espinal. And then at number 9, Kevin Biggio is wow. in my lineup as my designated hitter. Um, and all I am asking Kevin Biggio to do, I'm probably only giving him two plate appearances. Right, he's just in there when Kluber's in there, right? Like he's that's the only time he's like. As soon as they go to the bullpen, I'm probably they're probably gonna have a lefty against Biggio, so I'm probably bringing in Gritchick to to pinch hit for him there. Um, so it's really two plate appearances. Get on base once against Kluber. That's it. Right. Give me that 500 OBP. Use that selective approach. I know that his Biggio season has not been impressive. It's been a down year for him, obviously, but for what it's worth. The Blue Jays were impressed with the plate appearances that he was taking at AAA before he got called up. I know the results weren't great in those plate appearances, but they were impressed with the swing decisions and with the things he was doing at the plate. Get on base once, man. That's all I need. Get on base once for Springer, Simeon, Guerrero, Bichette, Hernandez, right? Like be like that leadoff guy in the nine hole. It's just two plate appearances. He's not in the field. Um, but that's that's the way that, you know, I'm rolling the dice on Kevin Biggio being able to walk once against Corey Kluber out of my number nine spot. And uh, that's how I'm lining it up. And that would be his first major league plate appearance in like a <laughs> month or two. Good yeah, luck. It's a big ass. <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I think you you did kind of convince me on one, on one um, player there, and it'd be Dickerson. I think, you know, when you look at those numbers against curves and, you know, what was it, five for 14, something like that? Against Kluber, um, yeah. I, I would actually, having heard that argument, I think I would swap out Lourdes and make Dickerson the DH. So yeah. let me, just for the record, uh, well, actually, the record on sportsnet.ca says differently. <laughs> but for the ATL <laughs> listeners, they will know yeah. that Arden convinced me to swap out Guriel, get him out of there, put Dickerson in. Yeah, I just don't think Guriel's healthy enough, man. Like, I think he's trying, right? But it's just, it, he didn't miss that much time, right? And I just don't think that, like, he's got stitches in his fingers. And, like, yeah. it's in a really tough spot with his fingers, too, like, right where he's gripping the bat. And I just think you look at the results these last few days. It's too bad. I hope he gets healthy enough to contribute on the weekend or certainly into the postseason if you get there. But I think right now a must win on Thursday, just considering what we've seen the last two days. I, I don't have him in there. Randall Gritchick doesn't make it into either of our lineups, Ben. No, I would keep him in. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. right. You didn't swap him out for Dickerson. You yeah. got Gritchick in So yours. I took out Lourdes. Cause, yeah. Because I think defensively, that outfield, if you have Teoscar, Springer, and Gritchick, that's a pretty good defensive outfield. And with Ray out there potentially getting a lot of fly balls, I like the chances of saving a run or two that way. That's the one like tough conversation that I have to have is, well, I have to have a tough conversation with Lourdes Gurriel Jr. and say, hey, I can't have you in. But then uh, I also have a tough conversation with Randall Gritchick and I have to say, hey, you're going to sit for two days in a row. And you're basically a well, bench bat a, for me at this point. Yeah, that's what he's been for yeah. September. I think they've been having that, you know, I, I think that's the realization that's kind of set in there is uh, he's, he's not a full-time player right now. Interesting stuff, man. So much on the line. I cannot wait for this game. It's going to be so cool. In front of a crowd, by the way, in front of uh, 30,000 or 28,000, 29,000, whatever they've had. Should be 45, really. Why don't they, like, let's just open it up, right? Like, what are we doing here? Like, can we get, like, what? so what? what's another 15,000, really, at this point? Right. I was looking around, and I'm sure some epidemiologists will come and tell me why I'm a moron for saying this, but, like, I was looking around the ballpark last night. People are crammed into a lot of these sections. Like it's yep. like almost full. Man, the like that was the first time at a ballpark last night in two years um, that I have felt like that like hair raising like chill after a huge moment, right? Of the place going nuts. And all I could think about was like, wow, how cool would it be if we had forty five thousand people here? If we had the full place? Um, I think at this point. Everybody in there is vaccinated. We all right. understand the risks. If you don't, you know, if, if you don't accept the risk, you don't go to the ballpark. Um, we get it, right? Like, but we're in the new normal now. Like, this is it. Nine out of 10 Torontonians are vaccinated fully. Uh, the vaccines work. Uh, we can like act like they do and all go to the ballpark and enjoy a baseball game. I don't like, I just think it's kind of marginal going from 15 to 30. I don't know why they just don't open the, uh, the entire place up. Yeah, I mean, it's uh, 30, obviously, a great step, and it is nice to have 30,000 people there. Um, but yeah, everyone in there is vaccinated. 
it's outdoors. Uh, nice having the outdoor baseball feel. And I would certainly welcome uh, the the return of more fans to Rogers Center. Yeah, that's what I think should happen. Uh, but it's going to be really cool to see it here on uh, Thursday night as the uh, Blue Jays complete what is essentially a playoff series with New York Yankees. Ben will be there. I'll be there. Uh, we'll have it all covered uh, at sportsnet.ca as we have it all covered today in the lead up to this game. So I want to thank you for listening to the Layers this week. I want to thank our producers, Christian Ryan and Nick Andrade. Enjoy this baseball. Live in the moment. This is it. This is really fun, really cool to get to see this uh, all playing out on Bremner Boulevard here in Toronto. And we'll talk to you next week on At The Letters.